Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Just one more second, please. Good morning. We're delighted that you could be with us for the 15th annual Duke UNC Rotary Peace Conference. My name is Bart Cleary, and I have the honor of being the, Rose, the Rotary Host Area Coordinator for this Peace Center. Last year, we were here bridging divides. Today, we gather around the theme, Pieces of Peace. As a courtesy to our presenters and your fellow guests, please take a moment to turn off your cell phones. I would like to begin um, first by introducing some special people that I've had the privilege to work with. As host area coordinator, part of my job is finding Rotarians and their partners to host the Rotary Peace Fellows during the two years they're here. So if you will, if you're hosting a Rotary Peace Fellow last year or this year, if you will, please stand so that we can all recognize you and give you a round of applause. Thank you very much for all you do, and I know the uh, Rotary Peace Fellows appreciate your hard efforts as well. I would like to introduce first the members of the Duke UNC Center uh, Peace Center Board to stand and be recognized. First, Susan Carroll, Managing Director. Jonathan Abels from Duke University. Nicholas Steiner from UNC. Carol Allen, our Rotary representative. Nobody knows how much effort Carol puts into this. Amy Cole, Program Director. And our co-directors, Catherine Adcock Adme from Duke, and Dr. Margaret Bentley from UNC. And we also have our co director emeritus, Francis Latham from Duke, and Jim Peacock from UNC. This year, we are privileged to have our first Rotary, Rotary Alumni Peace represent, uh, fellow representative as well, Carmen Striggle. She is actually out of town on work, so she couldn't be with us today. If you have a chance to meet them at break and at lunch, please thank them for their in inspiration and the support they give to the Rotary Peace Center program. Rotary leaders have been far-sighted and courageous in creating and sustaining the Rotary Peace Center programs and we have with us today several key people. First, I'd like to introduce Peter Kyle, chair of the Rotary Foundation Peace Program Committee. Peter. <laughs> Next, we have Chris Offer, chair of the Rotary Foundation Peace Program Major Gifts Committee. Chris. <laughs> and before I introduce our um, guest speaker, I would like to recognize Shafi Parekh and his wife, Marjam. Shafi is the <laughs> district governor of District 7010 this year. Today we'll hear a variety of opinions from the fellows, some that you might not agree with, but please remember that everyone is entitled to their opinions and courteous discourse is a key part of the conflict resolution. So now I'd like to introduce Ken Schubert Rotary Foundation Trustee Chair to come up and share a few words. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one correction, I'm not the chair, I'm the vice chair. That uh, I will bring you greetings from the uh, chair, Paul Netzel and his wife, Diane. Um, they're sorry they can't be here themselves today, but we start our trustee meetings 
Um, actually, I have a meeting at 2.30 uh, Sunday in Evanston, and we start all next week, and that's one reason that um, Chair Paul and Diane cannot be with you. But that's the good fortune that my wife Lynn and I have, that we're able to be back a second year in a row to be here at this wonderful presentation, because we really enjoyed last year, and we're looking very much forward to this year and the presentations. I have to tell you that um, I guess I'd be remiss if I come, since I come from an area of the world that kind of competes with uh, these two universities in various ways, and certainly in basketball, not very well at all, but uh, go Tar Heels and go Blue Devils. Now, if you come to Alabama, I'm not going to say that. Anyway, I want to say this on behalf of the Rotary Foundation. Truly, the program here at Duke UNC is one of the crown jewels in the Rotary Peace Center's program. When that started uh, almost 20 years ago, Duke UNC is one of the founding universities that has survived through this. There's been many changes of the original universities, but Duke UNC, uh, through the leadership of the faculty, the staff, and the students that have come through this program have made this one of the crown jewels of our Rotary Peace Centers. Um, if you're not familiar, there's six peace centers currently around the world, re uh, representing seven prominent universities from around the world. Uh, it's very inspirational to visit and see those. Uh, Lynn and I have been fortunate to see the peace program at Uppsala and at Bradford. Uh, we've not been able to see International Christian University in Japan or Queensland in Australia. But all of them, as we've talked and uh, visited with the directors, are doing an outstanding job making the, and educating and putting out in the real world the, the future leaders that will bring peace and conflict resolution to our world. I want to say to you, the, the Rotarians that are here, I know that you find this as much as I and Lynn do inspiring to hear from our peace fellows, to see what they've been doing over the past uh, two years for the second year fellows that will go out uh, in the world and make a difference. To hear their stories, to see their research projects, to see what they're doing, that's the inspiring thing for us as Rotarians and I think why we can feel so good about the support that we do of these six Rotary Peace Centers around the world. So without uh, hearing from me anymore, I'm sure that that is not why you came. There are some wonderful presentations that the Peace Fellows will make. Uh, I want to just thank each and every one of you for your past, your present, and your future support of the Rotary Peace Centers. And I know here in this room, especially here, the one at Duke UNC. But it's lends my honor to be here, represent the foundation. Uh, there's exciting things coming down the road, I think, with all the peace centers around the world and what we're doing. But uh, I thank you again and look forward to meeting you if I haven't. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you uh, back for our conference today and a welcome also to anyone who is watching on the live stream. Um, we're happy to have you with us as well. Um, I'd like to take this moment to introduce our first year Peace Fellows, who you will be able to hear uh, present at this conference next year. Um, so I will begin with our Peace Fellows at Duke University. We have Natalie Emery, please stand up, from Italy. We have Sekun Gajarel from Nepal. Chris Lara from Colombia. Al Husseini Mega from Mali. Branka Panic from Serbia. And our first year fellows at UNC, Mohammed Aid from Palestine. Thank you. 
Nigel Haywood from Australia. <laughs> Sajjad Hussain from Pal uh, Pakistan. <laughs> Shannon Longhurst from Australia. <laughs> and Vinyera Urbaiva from Kyrgyzstan. I'm going to take a moment also to um, just ask a few things. Make sure you see where all the exits are in the room. Um, and especially after the coffee break in the morning, we'd like to ask everyone to make a special effort to move in because by before lunchtime, we really expect a full house. So we'll, it would be a lot easier for newcomers to be able to um, find seats easily. Um, would also like to ask you not to walk um, across the back row. Um, I believe we've got seats up there, so it's a little bit difficult. But um, you can walk behind the camera. Since we have um, a live stream as well as we are re video recording the conference, um, it would be nice if you could walk behind that, those cameras. Um, as Bart said, please make sure your cell phones and pagers are turned off. Um, restrooms for men and women are on both this floor as well as um, upstairs, so you can go either way. Um, and then if you've been with our, us before for our conference, you know that we will have um, all of our graduating fellows will be presenting today and um, present in groups of three for the most part. We will also have um, class 15, that's the second year Peace Fellow, you will he see her a lot today. Chennai Kadungare um, from Zimbabwe will be narrating the conference and um, tying the theme pieces of peace to uh, the fellow's presentations. So I'm going to um, ask Chennai to come up and get us started. Morning, everyone. We begin by acknowledging the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, the traditional custodians of this land. We welcome Tar Heels, Blue Devils, and the rest of the Carolinians who make this place home. Welcome to faculty, staff, Rotarians, friends of Rotary, and members of the community here as well as online. We are excited to have you here as our honored guests today. We give you our pieces of peace to introduce you to our commitments to peace building for a plural world. In this first session, we examine conflict preventing actions for peace. These actions create opportunities out of current crises. The proposed interventions offer us new creative ways of optimizing old interventions for peace. We have Linda cautioning us about food waste and its effect on climate. Can you believe we can build peace with every meal we enjoy? How can we better steward what we easily take for granted daily? Afterward, Daniela discusses how creating job opportunities for young generations in the capital region of Brazil can prevent conflict, foster community development, and promote social cohesion. Are we ensuring youth have the right amount of opportunities? We end with Gabriele, who reflects on challenges and opportunities provided by the new kind of humanitarian response. He advocates to use innovative solutions to reduce poverty and empower people in times of crisis. Enjoy. So good morning. <laughs> it is my sincere pleasure to be here with you. Today, I'm going to share with you my journey of food, love, and waste in our age of climate change. I'm going to share with you how this is my piece of peace building as a Rotary Peace Fellow. But before I begin, I'd like to first ask a question. If you could choose one person to make you a meal, who would it be? 
and what would it be? Let me ask again, if you could choose one person to make you a meal, who would it be and what would it be? I'm going to come back to that question at the end of my presentation, but before I get to the end, I must start from the beginning. When I was small, <laughs> living in a small town in Canada, my immigrant parents did the one thing that they knew best. They opened a Chinese restaurant catered for the Western palate. Think giant deep fried egg rolls, <laughs> which did not originate in China. <laughs> Think fortune cookies, which actually were created in San Francisco. <laughs> so I grew up in Ruby's restaurant. As a child, I remember sitting on buckets in the kitchen, chopping mushrooms, celery, potatoes for the buffet. Eventually, I became a bus girl. One day, I became a waitress. Eventually, I moved to the big city to go to university. I lost my connection with food. But the next part of my journey started. I began to volunteer for the Canadian Red Cross. And eventually, I made my way to Geneva, where I worked for the International Red Cross for six years. Throughout this time, I experienced the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows. I witnessed heartwarming kindness. I witnessed heartbreaking despair. I also witnessed the impacts of climate change. Increased floods, climate change. Increased rot, climate change. More extreme weather events, climate change. Food insecurity, climate change. The tipping point for me was on my last crisis that I worked on, which was the migration crisis in Europe, which took place in 2015. At that time, I learned that drought in Syria made it difficult for farmers in the rural parts of the country to farm the foods they needed to eat. And so, more than one million Syrians migrated to these urban centers where there simply was not enough resources or infrastructure to cope, exacerbating local tension. And so, Europe became a pull factor. More than one million people, mostly from Syria, but also other parts of the world, landed on Europe's doorstep. I left that crisis feeling extremely overwhelmed. What is this thing called climate change? What can we do about it? What can I do about it? For the past two years, I've been a Peace Fellow, studying food policy, climate change, and political polarization. Throughout my educational journey, I have learned that along the entire food production supply chain, we burn fossil fuels and emit greenhouse gases. It begins when we transport our fertilizers to nurture our crops. It continues when we power our tractors, our barns, our equipment, even the livestock that we breed, the cows, pass a powerful greenhouse gas called methane. It continues when that food gets transported through grocery stores and then into our homes when we store them in our fridges. The whole time we're emitting greenhouse gases which get trapped in our atmosphere. Temperatures rise and climate change ensues. But it doesn't stop there. When we get home in North America, of the food that we buy, we waste, on average, 40% of that food, right? And in doing so, we continue to contribute to global warming. This is because when we throw away that food, as it rots in a landfill, it emits a powerful greenhouse gas called methane. Methane traps heat in our atmosphere 86 times more powerfully than carbon dioxide. And so, as we make the food and then throw away the food, we are literally doubling down on the greenhouse gases that we are emitting. And the irony is that as we continue to make more food, buy more food, and throw away more food, we are actually contributing to food insecurity. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a UN organization, if food waste were its own country, it would rank the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as we continue to emit greenhouse gases, as temperatures continue to rise, as we catalyze climate change, in Asia, we will see increased food insecurity due to droughts. In Africa, we will see 
decreased crop productivity. In our oceans, which are warming, our fishes will migrate differently, decreasing our fish catches. Our farmers will spend less time outside simply because it's too hot. Now this sounds daunting, but I want you to know that there's something we can all do about this. I've been studying food policy and climate change for the past two years. For the past two years, I've also been a research assistant at the World Food Policy Center at Duke. And it's my pleasure to share with you what I've learned. As I've mentioned, food waste is the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world behind the United States and China. That sounds like a big, daunting task, given our commitments to the Paris Agreement. But the world is mobilizing. Sustainable Development Goal Target 12.3 aims to reduce food waste by 50% by the year 2030. And governments are taking action. Let me pause here and ask who here has been to a Chinese banquet? Maybe a Chinese wedding, a Chinese New Year, a Chinese dinner? Right. So then you know, in the Chinese culture, as in many cultures, food is love. Food is respect. We simply overfeed you. But as such, we waste food. In China, the Ministry of Commerce has introduced a policy whereby government catered banquets must reduce food waste. In South Korea, they have introduced a pay-as-you-throw policy whereby families who throw away organic waste must pay for the weight they throw. As such, families who throw away less pay less. In the land of wine and cheese in France, it is now illegal for supermarkets to throw away food. And so, they are working more with food banks and local community organizations to redistribute that food where it's needed most. Here in the United States, the national government has launched a goal to reduce food waste by 50% by the year 2030, in line with the sustainable development target. Now, I've told you a lot about national policies, but what I really want to tell you is that the real action is local, where you and I live, in our communities, in our towns, in our cities. This is an example of an educational campaign implemented in the city of Vancouver, what I like to call my hometown. This was an education campaign that encouraged people not to throw away food for all the reasons that I explained. Here, in this fantastic state of North Carolina, the state legislature has introduced a statute called the Immunity for Food Donation Statute, whereby citizens of North Carolina, like myself, are protected from liability in case food that we donate makes someone ill by accident. The last example that I will share with you comes from the beautiful city of Seattle. Seattle has introduced an organic waste ban, and so it is now illegal for people in Seattle to throw away their food in their garbage cans. If food is found in their cans, they can get fined, or that garbage can can simply get left on your curbside. <coughs> Now, I've told you about the importance of advocating for better policy, but I also want to tell you that there are creative things happening in communities around the world. More and more, we're seeing in schools the introduction of food sharing tables, whereby students can put unopened food items on a table so another student can come and take that food and eat it so it doesn't go to waste. In the United Kingdom, we're seeing the increasing popularity of community fridges, whereby people can drop off food that's about to expire so someone else can take that food and use it before it goes bad. My key message to you is this. Climate change can be overwhelming, but food is not. In the developed world, we all eat and we all waste. We can all do something every day to mitigate climate change together by reducing our food waste. Imagine if every one of us in this room wasted one less banana every day. Now imagine if all 1.2 million Rotarians around the world wasted one less banana every day. That is a lot less food going into landfill, a lot less greenhouse gas being emitted. That is every one of us working together every day to reduce food waste, every one of us working together every day to mitigate climate change. Now, we're gathered here today at a peace conference. What does food waste, climate change, and peace building have in common? 
so much. I told you earlier that I used to work for the Red Cross. I saw firsthand how when resources are scarce, such as land and water due to climate change, conflict ensues. I see how small island states, such as Fiji and Seychelles, live under the constant threat of the day when sea levels will rise so high that they will lose their islands and they will become climate change refugees. We all see every day how the impacts of increasing natural disasters affect our communities, especially vulnerable communities who do not have the resources or capacities to cope when they lose their lands, when their infrastructure is broken. Climate change affects sustainable development. Climate change affects peace. But there is something every one of us can do every day in the choices we make, in what we choose to buy, in what we choose to eat, in what we choose to waste, and what we choose to not waste. Together, we can reduce food waste. Together, we can mitigate climate change. So in closing, I'm going to come back to the story, uh, the question I asked you at the beginning of my presentation. If you could choose one person to make you a meal, who would it be, and what would it be? I hope that during today's breaks, you will come and find me and share your story with me. I hope you will share it with the other Rotarians you meet here today. And I will share mine with you. The meal that I would choose would be potato pancakes. Now, that might come as a bit of a surprise, <laughs> but let me explain why. When I was young and my parents opened their restaurant, they worked 20 hours a day. And so, I moved in with family, a friend, family friends, Elisa and Ben. Ben was a motorcycle scout who was in World War II for the Canadian forces. And when he was based in Belgium, he met Elisa at a war dance. They fell in love and he brought her home as his war bride. Eventually, I moved in with Elisa and Ben, first for six months, eventually six years. Every week, Elisa made homemade potato pancakes. I can still hear the sound of Ben grating the potatoes. I can still smell the butter, the batter, the potatoes all mixing together. I can still hear the crackling in the frying pan as Elisa would pour that batter into the pan along with all of her love. Elisa and Ben are no longer with us, but to this day, potato pancakes remain my favorite food memory. And on this note, I want to encourage every one of you, when you go home, to make your favorite meal for someone you love. Find your favorite ingredients they might already be in your fridge. Savor the smells and bask in the warmth that travels from your hands to your heart when you share something you love with someone you love. And don't waste a single bite of every delicious moment. Thank you. the great pleasure of being Linda's advisor and I've enjoyed her for so many years and I'd love to give everybody here a chance to signal that you're interested in asking a question and then we'll, we'll continue the conversation. Can somebody be the first? Thank you. <laughs> um, so when the food is composted it is First of all, it's important that compost is not contaminated, which is why we separate um, our foods from the other waste streams. But when it's uh, composted properly, it can be reused um, and you know, for our gardens and other such things. But yes, it does, energy does get used. So in that process, certainly, there is some that's being emitted, but much less than the methane that would you know, re be released into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you for starting us. Others? 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, we have a, a microphone for you. Being this a peace conference is wonderful to start with the most basic and profound ingredient of peace, <laughs> that is love. Yeah. And uh, love is a word uh, we use very much. But now we have concretely focused how food, eating, the interaction that happened between eating, because even now, moments of eating, even when there has been very well selected and all that, we see sometimes the technology putting aside those moments of eating, yeah. that is a great sharing. Yeah. And uh, so I feel that your combination of using a value of love in peace together with the, with the knowledge of what kind of food we should eat, how we are affecting the climate change, and how is the responsibility that each of us carry, because each of us are contributing, makes this very excellent. Congratulations. It has been a wonderful, and also congratulations to the mentor or advisor. Oh, Thank you I don't much. deserve any of it. You do, completely. <laughs> there's, there's definitely love that goes down here. <laughs> All right, thank you for amplifying. We really appreciate that. And I'm Peruvian, and we produce two sorts of the world, two sorts of varieties of pancakes. Yes, <laughs> the pancakes. I see someone way high. Please. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, was the events in Egypt uh, related to climate change? <clears throat> Do the events in Egypt, Egypt relate to climate change? Yes. Mm. Do we have an Egypt expert in the house? <laughs> no, I mean, I, what I want, well, I guess how I'll answer that is um, the thing about climate change is we feel its impacts long after, um, or like long after it happens. So we, get, we have line of sight to the immediate impacts long after things are set in motion. So if I recall the details behind the uprising, um, in Egypt, a lot of it had to do with food prices. So why were food prices high? Because there was food insecurity. Why was there food insecurity? Now, this is not what I've been studying, so don't quote me, but if I were to go and do a bit of research, I'm guessing that it probably had to do with the fact that the crops were not yielding as much food as was needed, therefore driving up the prices so people could not afford the food, and here we have food insecurity. And why are the crops not dropped? producing as much as needed. I'm guessing if we look back in the timeline, because remember, we have line of sight to the impacts long after climate change has put its fingerprints on it. I'm guessing, you know, drought or water scarcity and many of those things would have had to do with why there was not enough, not enough food being produced. Thank you. All right, I saw one hand there and another one there, so. Good morning, thank you for this great talk. Um, I don't know if this is your area of expertise or not, but I'm wondering if you could speak to current research or current thinking with regard to veganism um, and climate change and, and peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, my master's project is actually on municipal climate change policy to mitigate climate change. So I've been talking to a lot of people in the local food system here in Durham and also actually nationally for my work with the World Food Policy Center. And veganism has come up. Um, it has a much um, smaller footprint, of course, um, when it comes to producing the product, um, even less, much less waste of it, simply because um, individuals who do follow a vegan lifestyle tend to be much more conscious of their um, carbon footprint. However, in terms of impact at scale, um, because the population, the numbers of people that are vegans are so much smaller, in relative comparison to the larger population, when we're talking about wanting to have impact, that's why a lot of the work is focusing on maybe Main Street diets. Right there. I live in a small town and I eat lunch in our school cafeterias quite often. And I see the amount of uh, garbage that goes from school lunches into the garbage can that goes to our small landfill. Mm -hmm. Are there any policies through Duke that I could take back to my school board to um, try to introduce the policy that you've just explained? So happy you've asked me that. <laughs> because this is a really, how many people in here are, are parents? Please raise your hand. 
Yeah. So you've probably experienced maybe in your local school some concerns with food sharing, maybe due to allergies or health conditions, et cetera. So in fact, the USDA, um, the United States Department of Agriculture, has issued a memo to all um, regional and state nutritional directors, which actually promotes food sharing tables. And in that memo, um, it includes all of the sort of health considerations to consider um, to address any concerns. Now that's a federal um, guidance document that's been issued. And then when it rolls down to the state level, it's up to the state nutrition director to decide whether or not to promote that policy within the school boards in their state. And I will say that the um, ab absorption or adoption of this uh, policy or encouragement varies from state to state. So here I will say in the state of North Carolina, while at the state level um, there is some concerns with food sharing tables, I know for a fact because of my research that at the local level here in Durham and the Durham Public Schools, um, they have worked with the local um, county school health official and health official within the local school board to start to make food sharing tables happen uh, in local schools because they know that federally it's encouraged. State, um, they've been given caution, cautionary advice. <laughs> so really it's about how entrepreneurial do you want to be? You know, at the federal level, the guidance is there. And then it's about taking the initiative um, and talking to the right people, getting the right people on board. So if you'd like to come up to me after and share your email address with me, I'm happy to share with you these documents so you can bring them back to your school and work with your teachers and other parents. And be the entrepreneurial person. Thank you. I think I saw somebody down here. Thank you. From a personal story to uh, government, since you mentioned government. So I came from uh, the Pacific Islands before mm. I, you know, many years ago. And even then in the 80s, we knew that the islands were losing some land. Right. And so when I went to Houston, people who, who owned property in Galveston says, no, no, no. The ocean isn't rising. So how do you convince people, especially the current administration, about <laughs> climate change? <laughs> just, just, you know, you don't have to answer it all. Just, yeah. just one little thing. Thanks. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, we had the whole day to talk about that. No, um, OK. So. Actually, how I'll answer that is I'll say that I've come to learn that climate change can be very polarizing. Um, and through another initiative I've been involved with that I'll have the opportunity to share with you later this afternoon with uh, another Peace Fellow, I've learned about the importance of discourse, which Bart mentioned earlier when he introduced today's conference, the importance of discourse. Um, because climate change has such different personal impacts on every individual. You know, I, I, I went to university in Vancouver Always sunny, maybe it rains a little, never snows. But three years ago, it snowed. My mother, who's not used to walking on ice, slipped and broke her wrist. I mean, you know, it never snows in Vancouver, really. That's a personal impact. A farmer who um, you know, relies on his or her livelihood to produce as much crop and sell as much crop as possible, you know, they might see the impacts of climate change a little differently. It affects their bottom line. Um, so there are so many different views around climate change, why it's good, why, sorry, why it's bad, but also some people think it's good. And I actually think it's really important to listen to what they have to say and understand what's driving their thought process, their values underneath it, because only by listening to each other and trying to understand each, point, each other's points of view can we come to maybe what, what are the underlying values underneath those, polar, um, those polar, polar opposite views and maybe even see some commonality in our shared views and values. And that doesn't answer sort of your specific question about how do we uh, address this with the current administration, but I think that greater piece of dialogue needs to start happening, you know, on every issue, but especially and also on climate change. And I think there's not enough of that happening. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. So proud of you, <laughs> really. All right, we've come to the end of this one, and we'll go on. Jenna, are you? Is it?
Good morning. Thank you all here and in my home country for this amazing opportunity to share my strategic view on improving employment opportunities in the federal district, the capital of Brazil, where I'm, I, I'm from. In the 1960s, my country, Brazil, developed a new capital, Brasilia, moving its administration and political structure from Rio de Janeiro to the middle of the country. This has prompted a massive migration of people to the region, especially those seeking for jobs. In the past few years, however, the federal capital has experienced an increase in unemployment rates. Unemployment in the district jumped from 13.6% in 2015 to 20.7% of labor force in March 2017. But the most affected by the rising unemployment rates are the youth. With soaring rates of unemployment that was in November 2017 was affecting 42% of population between ages 16 and 24 years old. This problem has severely impacted both economic development and livelihoods of people in the region. When people can find work, they are at higher risk of being involved in violence and crime, committing suicide, abusing drugs, and other problems affecting overall peace, security, and development. Today, my objective here is to inform, involve, and motivate you while I'm answering three main questions. What is causing the rise of unemployment in the capital of Brazil, my hometown? How can this problem be addressed? And how the Rotary Peace Fellowship has enabled me to contribute in this process of addressing unemployment and ensuring peace? In the heart of Brazil, the federal district is one of the newest capital regions in the world. The district houses Brasilia, a city carefully designed and built in the 1960s to accommodate the administrative and political structure of Brazil. Recognized as a UNESCO heritage site for its modern human project, Brasilia represents the national dream of a new concept of life based on a promise of collective well-being. However, Brasilia is also a picture of Brazil's historic inequality. The city designers did not plan for everyone that eventually inhabited Brasilia. There was a massive inflow of workers who migrated to build the new capital, and they had to settle not in, but around Brasilia. Urban designers assumed that satellite cities would arise to attend the housing needs for the workers, but they made no plans for their development. This oversight led to a disorganized settlement of people around Brasilia, challenging public capacity to cope with infrastructure and inclusive access to public goods and services. Today, this area is the third most densely populated urban center of Brazil, housing three million people. And although the capital region provides great quality of life for some of its residents, this benefit does not extend to all in the district. There are high disparities between neighborhoods that threatens the government objectives, limit economic capacity, and put at risk future plans and prospects for inclusive growth and development. And one of the main problems encouraging violence and increasing peace in the region is the rising unemployment rates. The rising unemployment in the federal district has its roots both in the supply of labor and demand for labor. On the supply side, both the high inflow of people seeking for better livelihood, the high number of local population between the ages 15 and 45, and the mismatch in what many of these workers have been trained to do, all affect the ability of the market to absorb the growing workforce. 
People from all over the country still migrating to the federal district and its metropolitan region. They possess many different skills and interests, have a wide range of formal and informal education, and often come with a wealth of experience. As a consequence, there is high competition in the job market, and Brazilians' uh, inexperienced local youth often cannot compete. On the other hand, the demand for labor has decreased as the country has faced recession, macroeconomic instability, and a severe political crisis. There are many unaddressed structural issues, such as too much regulations on doing business uh, and barriers on trade in the global market. We have companies and entrepreneurs. We have natural resources. We build airplanes. We host tourists. We need to free up this potential. But the federal district has also unique challenges connected to its strategic role of housing the political and administrative structure of the nation. This includes legal restrictions on land use, heavy bureaucratic processes that restrict local government capacity, and the historic budget priority given the support to the public service sector while overlooking the development of the private sector in the region. All these issues undermine the creation of an entrepreneurial, inclusive ecosystem able to generate opportunities for the growing population seeking for better livelihoods in the capital of Brazil. And again, among those who have the least economic opportunity are the young generations and those living just outside Brasilia in areas with lower per capita income and limited public infrastructure, all of which can be a risk factor to social cohesion. Although the capital offers many strengths and opportunities, the government up until now has not fully taken advantage of those strengths. For instance, one of the major opportunities in the federal district is its intangible human potential formed by a diverse population, which has constantly achieved the highest marks in education attainment in the country. There is a high concentration of researchers and individuals with college education in the capital, which I will rejoin in the incoming months. And Brasilia houses one of the best public universities of the country, the University of Brasilia. The local government has shown political will to move forward with promising projects, but we still lacking the necessary coordination and collaboration to succeed. We have all the pieces but we still not, have not put the puzzle together. But there are ways forward. For example, using North Carolina as a model for success, I believe that the federal district has an opportunity to lead the country towards the development dream of the 21st century, a knowledge-based economy. Economic growth based in knowledge and, the, and research is exactly what George Simpson, the first director of the North Carolina Research Triangle, had in mind when he forecasted in 1956 that to achieve progress, it would be necessary to stimulate the development of a new state of mind in North Carolina and to overcome cultural obstacles, such as the failure of the people to grasp the use of science in industrial development the failure to put to work what is available, the failure to begin those chain reactions of research and innovation. Similarly, in the federal district, I believe that we need to use the existing momentum and the political will to develop a technology park in the region to make this transition towards a better future for all. Yet to be successful, Brazilia's new technology park will need four critical components. First, we need a transparent, inclusive, and accountable process. Presently, the government is increasing its efforts in build public-private partnerships as a way to attract companies in the field of IT and biotechnology to the federal district, but the process needs to foster trust, responsiveness, and accountability. 
Just like the Research Triangle Park, this project needs to include universities and other schools that can promote creativity, innovation, and relevant skills development to meet market demand. We need to stimulate the minds and energy of youth so they can work in and build the companies and products of the future. A successful implementation also needs to be supported by policies to improve ways of doing business while offering special economic incentives for companies to settle in the surrounding area of Brasilia. These incentives will help to decentralize the economic activities to the satellite cities, addressing existing inequalities. And finally, it is necessary to create a cross-sector collaborative management organization that can promote the necessary change of mindset and cultural behavior, which is holding back the individual and societal development in the capital region of Brazil. But my main takeaway while developing this strategy uh, for the future of my home district is the importance of education, partnership, and collaboration for economic and community development. Those are main areas of focus of Rotary. And I believe that the Peace Fellowship Program that allowed me to be here today is an important tool to enable and encourage individuals and inspire connections that can enable a, a better global future. As some among you know, I have spent my career in law enforcement and my focus has been on effective public security management, which is an essential condition for development. This focus on peace, security, and development led me to become part of the UN forces in Haiti in 2012, as well as to my studies at Duke, what combined development and security. My hope after returning to Brasilia as a senior law enforcement officer is to work in cooperation with the Economic Development Administration and to implement this program I'm sharing with you today. Any progress that my community can achieve in the future based on my project will be built on the knowledge and connections I have gained during my program in Duke. And these improvements are the result of your generosity of spirit and a strategic entrepreneurial view. In conclusion, I would like to highlight the vision expressed in a recent United Nations Human Development Report that the social value of employment goes far beyond the salary. Universal access to decent jobs is a key part of building resilience across society. Work is a means of livelihood in strengthening human capacity, in providing social connections, and in the long term, it is responsible for providing security for families and communities. Promoting job opportunities, especially for vulnerable groups, is a way to achieve sustainable community development. It's a way to empower present and future generations and to enable peace and prosperity in society. And this approach to improve employment opportunities in Brazil's federal district is my contribution to peace and development. Thank you. I'm happy to answer your questions. Is it on? Hello? OK, thanks. It is a real pleasure uh, to be able to help and work with someone who is going to be a leader in her country. Uh, thank you for doing that. We're ready for questions. Yes, please. Uh, Jim. Thank you. Uh, you connect many things. One, being a police person, and the other, community and economic development. Uh, you mentioned George Simpson, who in 1956 created the Research Triangle Park. He was a sociologist. Could you say more about how you, as a police officer and peace fellow, would encourage community cohesion? 
Thank you for your question. Uh, it's a very important thing uh, to break this bias against law enforcement, I think. <laughs> and I, <laughs> uh, I, I can be an example, maybe. Uh, so I have been working in trying to, and, and I have been working in the communities my whole life, seeing the struggles and the problems that people uh, live in their daily basis. And uh, this led me to this idea of graduating in law first and trying to make the best uh, management of public security because I believe that security is the first uh, parameter that enables all the other activities in society. If you don't have security, sometimes you cannot go to a school, you cannot receive education, you cannot uh, plant your food because you, you may be stilled. So I believe that uh, you start community engagement, you start community cohesion by uh, promoting and providing security for people. And uh, it's, it's, it's a, uh, the, the social economic development uh, and security, I think that they are completely connected. And well, I, I, I will strive to, to make those connections when I come home and continue doing it around the world too. Great. I think you have another question here. Yes, hi, thank you very much. Um, one of the uh, factors that correlates highest with economic prosperity is a lack of political corruption. Yes. And conversely, stagnation of economies is high corruption. I actually have two questions for you since you're a law enforcement officer. Is that I noticed that several of the impediments are government impediments. I wonder if corruption's a big problem holding Brazil back. And then the second one that's uh, kind of interesting since you're a law enforcement officer is that uh, Rio de Janeiro's become a bit of a war zone with all the gun violence that's there. Is, ever, is that a fair statement? Uh, what does you A lot of gun violence in Rio de Janeiro? Well, uh, in Rio de Janeiro right now, we, we are facing a real crisis in security. Uh, it's not my state specifically. Okay. And uh, we are facing actually a federal intervention right now to yeah. help the security. I just want to make sure I had that right. And I recently yeah. read that um, it's illegal to own a firearm in Brazil. And one of the it suggestions is. is that to allow people to get background checks and buy like three or four firearms, since the police aren't protecting the people. I wonder if you had any comment on that, as well as corruption. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, uh, first of all, about corruption. Yes, we have a very serious uh, issue with corruption. And I think uh, the, the whole idea of impeachment of the president and all the process that the judiciary is uh, passing through right now and, and reinforcing that uh, there is checks and balances uh, in the system is being strengthened by that. And uh, in the federal district specifically, we have been uh, living a great improvement in government capacity to actually move forward with uh, plans, state plans specifically. So I cannot say that in Brazil as a whole, as a country, as like for instance here in the, in the US, the country is so big that each state has its own level of development. And in Brazil, it's the same. So in the federal district, we have a very good uh, government capacity, and, uh, and a lot of improvements have been done in the last years. So I, I believe that the level of corruption in the district is a little bit, uh, it's, it's very less than in other states of Brazil. And uh, this is one of the reasons that it becomes a very big opportunity to actually lead with innovative projects such as a technology park. Um, the second uh, question about gun violence. So I am a law enforcement uh, uh, agent in Brazil. I have a very personal uh, 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 opinion about uh, guns, and I think that our uh, our context is completely different than the context of the U.S., for instance. 
Uh, our legislation is completely different. We have uh, uh, a very restrict regulation for civilians to uh, possess firearms. Uh, in fact, any civilian can possess firearms. And, um, and we still have many problems with uh, gun violence. So I think every context has its own uh, situation, and, and one rule doesn't fit for all in this specific topic. So I hope I answer your question. Thank you. I think we have another question here, and then after a question here. To get the improvement you seek will require a lot of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Have you considered using your local Rotary Clubs to help you reach out to those people? Yes, in fact, I think Dr. Uh, Professor Francisco Schlavitz, that is our Rotary coordination, he may be watching today uh, in Brazil. Uh, he is one of the uh, one amazing uh, individual that is connected with the Rotary Club, uh, the Rotary Five of December, and they are actually in one of the private, one a great private uh, institution of uh, higher education in Brasilia, as one of my plans of uh, boosting this idea of connecting uh, the private education, the public education, to actually improve uh, and move forward with this project. And uh, for sure, he knows that. <laughs> We actually talk almost every day. I'm, I'm connected with my Rotary Club in Brasilia, and uh, we are moving forward with many projects together, and I'm, I'm definitely counting with their support. Thank you. Okay. We have one more time for one more question. What is the role of the universities? Uh, because I'm struck by the fact you have 42% of unemployed uh, young people, but at the same time, I'm quoting you, you say young people that are educated, but in, with inexperience. So therefore, if you are educating, and I noticed that in all Latin America, there is like a competition to get more papers, more degrees, more certificates. Now, before, when you were a master's degree, you have a position. Now, even if you are a PhD, yes. I mean, nothing. You need a postgraduate and all that. So this is a very much formalization uh, in Brasilia, who seem to be the Niemeyer dream uh, this wonderful architecture, the architect that constructed uh, Brasilia, but it was a Brasilia was supposed to be like a thin thunk of the bureaucratic system. Yeah. So how you relate bureaucratic minds dealing with public policies, university forming younger generations and having the quote, they are young, educated, I imagine, full of enthusiasm and wanting to contribute to peace and development in your country, but they have no experience. What do we mean by experience? What is the role? How, how can they get that experience? What that the university can do, what the country and the public policies can do for them? Thank you for your question. So, in, the, in Brasilia, we have this, such a migration pattern that a lot of people come from other parts of Brazil, especially uh, those that are educated in, in Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, that are more, more traditional urban centers and economic developed. And they come to Brasilia, especially to compete mainly for public jobs. So uh, we have this, this flaw in the education system in which uh, the majority of people is formed to pursue a job in the, in the uh, public administration. And I think this, this idea is not, uh, it's not sustainable anymore. You know, this is the main issue and this is the main, main idea here is to try to create a different uh, or, or stimulate a different sector, the growth of a different sector, the private sector in the region. Because uh, like I, I am young, I'm not retiring so, so soon. So if people are trying to pursue my job, they will have to wait a little bit more. And because, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, and because we have uh, this economic uh, uh, recession, uh, the public sector is not opening more jobs. 
So we have to try to stimulate the private sector in the region uh, to actually give the, the opportunity for this young population to, to acquire uh, experience because they will have a, a job to pursue. And by doing this, they will be able to actually contribute with the development of the, their community and feel empowered and, and promote peace and development. I truly believe that. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to all Rotary members, colleagues, friends, family from Italy, people watching from home, and a special thank you to Rotary District 2041 of Milan. I am Gabriele Gardenal. I have, I'm studying public health at UNC Chapel Hill, and for many years I have been managing projects and organizations delivering aid to displaced population. I've seen many projects. Some improve living condition for a few months, others for longer. And I have this question with me. How can I do my work better? What methods can improve living condition among displaced population for longer time? I came here at UNC with that question. I learned how to measure projects' impacts, and so I'm able to compare them across different projects and understand which methods works better. So, Today, I want to share with you the results of my research on cash transfer. To do so, I want to take you on a trip, a special one. One that few millions of people do each year. A trip away from war. In November 2012, I was living in the city of Goma in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Major newspaper reported the city was taken by the rebels. I want to share with you 30 seconds of a documentary that was shot in the stretch of road between the front line of the conflict and the city of Goma. During those days, thousands of people walked that road seeking protection. Let's look at the video. Sixty five point six million was the size of the displaced population in 2016 around the world, displaced by violence, war, human rights violation. The majority, 40 million people, are internally displaced people. These are people that flee their home and resettle within their home country. Only the minority, 22 million people, are refugees meaning people that resettle in another country, and most of the time do so in a neighboring country. In fact, the majority of refugees resettle in the same region where they're from. We've seen at the trip and how it looks like. Let's also look at the waiting condition once refugees and displaced population settle. This is a picture of the Mugunga camp near Goma, shot in 1996. You can see sick refugees lying on the ground. No health, water, and sanitation infrastructure. This is a, camp, is a picture of the same camp that I visited several times because of my work, shot in 2012. The inhabitants are those that we see in the video. Still, the level of poverty is extremely high. Settlement can be found most of the time near urban areas. And settlements in the Middle East, where we have a current crisis, share some of the similarities to those in Africa. People are living in tents covered with plastic sheets. Toilets are outside the tent shared by many families. But still, winter can be pretty harsh in the Middle East, especially in Lebanon, in the mountains where this camp is. Camps can be found inside cities, 
such as the case of Beirut, where Syrian and Palestinian refugees resettled. Personal, social, and economic relationship grow between the displaced community and the host community. Displaced community take up daily job within the host community and shop at the market stands of the host community. Humanitarians really look at different dimensions of poverty and are interested in measuring poverty. What are the lessons that we can get from these studies? Poverty is a multidimensional problem. What does that mean? Most of the time, people don't have adequate access, food, shelter, education, health services, all at the same time. I hope this part of the presentation managed to share with you the sense of urgency that pushed myself and colleagues to go and work in the field, but also this indirect support that we receive from people like you and governments to continue and do our job. Let's look at what solutions we have to reduce poverty among such population. We have three main methods that share some similarity but are also different and have different impacts. In-kind distribution, vouchers, cash transfer. Let's look at them. In-kind distribution. It means distribution of food and essential non-food items. These are selected by a group of experts and refugees go to the distribution point and pick them up. Vouchers are similar to food stamps. A specific economic amount is transferred through a voucher. Beneficiary can spend it on a predetermined list of items and group of shops. Now you may wonder, what if we're in a rural area and we have no markets, or the market is not capable to sustain such a demand? In that case, suppliers from the city are called and come to the, urban, to the rural area, set up a fair where beneficiary can retrieve the value of the voucher. Usually, the fair lasts a few days. Let's look at cash transfer. This can be transferred through three main modalities. Deposited in a debit card, transferred through mobile app, cash in hand, meaning beneficiary come to the distribution point and physically pick up the cash. For today's presentation, when I'm talking about cash, Sorry, skip ahead. There you go. Today, when talking about cash, I refer to it as unrestricted and unconditional, meaning beneficiaries are free to spend it as they want and don't need to do anything in order to receive it. If we want to say that a product or a service is better than another, we need to compare it, and this needs to be to strike better in a different set of criteria. The criteria I looked at for this comparison Effectiveness, satisfaction, efficiency, relationship, capacity to improve relationship, and risk reduction. And my thesis is that cash is better than in-kind distribution and uh, vouchers. Let's look. Cash can access beneficiaries better than the other two methods. An example, an organization in Nepal after the earthquake tried to deliver in-kind. Roads were not practical. Distribution delayed. Beneficiary in need of basic item kept waiting. Another example can be provided by rainy season in Africa, when roads and airstrip are not practicable. Let's look also at access from the beneficiary perspective. Beneficiary needs to walk from their home to the distribution point and back carrying the items in the shoulder. Sometimes these are bikes, so they need to call other family members to the distribution point, and they're not working during that time. Similarly, if the shop that is selected by the organization is far away from home, beneficiary needs to walk to the shop and back each time they need to buy something. As we see, poverty has many dimensions. And to say that cash has the capacity to reduce poverty, I wanted to look at a very important aspect, food security. And this is measured through an indicator, the food score consumption, that looks if the nutritional intake is adequate. Boston Consulting Group evaluated a project in Lebanon where beneficiaries were randomized or allocated by chance to receive the same economic amount either through vouchers or cash. After eight months, they compared the two groups. 
As you can see, beneficiary who received cash has a better score in food security compared to beneficiary who received voucher. For those of you interested in statistics, the result is significantly statistical. Let's move on. A beneficiary in the Democratic Republic of Congo said, when my husband received cash, he called me and asked me what to buy. We had a family meeting and we decided according to the needs of each member of the family. It was a celebration day. This and many other interviews with the beneficiary demonstrate how cash considered their dignity, matches their priority, respected their needs, and empowers them to make decisions. But I was also interested in looking at how is it working? How's the level of acceptance of this? Beneficiary who received vouchers, only 40% of times confirmed their preference for vouchers. Those who received cash, 92% of times confirmed their preferences for cash. But is it more efficient? Beneficiaries who receive cash are free to spend it where they want and on what they want. They have better knowledge of the market than organizations and experts do, so consider they take into consideration transportation time and cost and where prices are more competitive. This leads to reduction in transportation costs and shopping at lower prices. When in Lebanon, when cash was delivered as a method of aid, improved, increased the purchasing power by 15 up to 20% compared to vouchers. This is more efficient. As a peace builder, I'm interested in human relationship and how the projects impact them. A project in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which distributes cash to beneficiaries, reported that 44% of times beneficiaries received cash improved their relationship within the family and 1% of times deteriorated relationship. Let's look also at the community level, what happens, because not all beneficiaries within the same community may receive cash. And here, 24% of times beneficiaries reported cash improved their relationship within communities, but 5% it deteriorated them. This is not a comparison yet. So another project in Lebanon reported that disputes within the family were evenly splitted between beneficiaries who received cash and those who receive vouchers. What we don't know yet is how is cash spent. This is the breakdown of expenditure of the same project which allocated vouchers and cash to beneficiaries. As you can see, the breakdown, just look, don't try to read all the numbers, please. <laughs> um, the breakdown is very similar, and both methods in Lebanon manage to match beneficiary needs. Lebanon has good access to market and services, better than other parts of the world. Do we see the same results? So I went and looked at the Democratic Republic of Congo, and this is the breakdown of cash expenditure. Most of it was spent on clothes, food, health and education services, household items, land, etc. We have two lessons from this slide. One, in some areas, cash can buy intangible services and assets that vouchers and non-food non items cannot buy. The second one is that antisocial expenditure, meaning alcohol, gambling, tobacco, were 0.07%, meaning this is almost negligible. What we've learned today, cash improve access better than vouchers and in-kind distribution. It also has the capacity to reduce poverty better. It increases the dignity and has the capacity to empower beneficiary better than other methods. It has the capacity to cover multi-sectoral needs. It's better value for your money. It increases purchasing power. It also has the capacity to improve family and community relationships. And also, there's no risk of antisocial expenditure among beneficiaries who receive cash. So I think we can conclude cash is a better method to deliver aid than other methods. Also, beneficiaries who receive cash, when they have the means, they have also better knowledge and capacity of how to satisfy their needs better than we or experts do. So if cash is better, 
Are we using it enough? The expenditure of cash since 2014 duplicated. And UN reported that in 2016, $1.9 billion was spent in cash and vouchers together. Of this, only 51% was spent on cash. And this doesn't account for in-kind distribution. So at the last World Humanitarian Summit, donors such as the US, UK, France, Italy, and so on, and major humanitarian organization committed to keep increasing the use and coordination of cash-based projects. So I think today I share with you the answer to that question that I had in the field a few years ago. Is there a better way to alleviate poverty, especially among displaced population and people fleeing the war? Yes, we have. It is cash. I hope that sharing this with leaders such as Rotary members and all the people here today will help to decrease poverty among displaced population. Next time, when you're thinking about a donation, ask yourself, why not doing it in cash this time? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This presentation is very near and dear to my heart because my research and teaching is on refugees. So I, I, I'm constantly thinking about how do you help refugees, whether it's Syrians in Jordan or Burmese right here in Chapel Hill. And I think the brilliance of your presentation is that you can act globally and locally in exactly the same way. And the cash works in both ways. So thank you so much for that. Love to have some questions. I'd love to have the questions be as short as possible so we can get as many in as possible because they're so good. Um, right here, please. Have you, did you look at the inflation factor? It strikes me as if you suddenly put tens of thousands of dollars into one community, to that market, that village, that community, the prices in the market are going to rise. Thank you. So I think we need to look at the assumption be, behind the uh, cash projects. And one of the assumptions is that we have a working market and is capable to sustain such a huge inflation in terms of, like, such a huge increase in the demands. There are also risks that need to combine with other methods, such as in-kind distribution and voucher. This might kill, on the other side, the local uh, production capacity. So yeah, I think it's one of the assumptions that we also need to take into consideration before entering a market. Right here, please. Here you can have mine. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. When you look at displaced people, internally displaced people or externally displaced people, most of these camps are in areas that are not close to where they would be utilizing this cash. What about infrastructure you know, to, 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 to create? You know, how do they go and, and get the stuff that they want with cash? And would it not be a, 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 a system where it would be uh, you know, not cash, but you know, kind and cash? Right. Thank you for the question. So you're right. When displaced camps and communities are close to cities or markets are present, cash is the better solution. If markets are not present, then we need to go for our second best option. Most of the time we've seen that displaced camps are close to urban areas or the size of the displaced population compared to the people already living in the area, sometimes it's, it's smaller. So, uh, markets can allow us to use cash. But yeah, if markets or like we're in a rural area, it is difficult. Now, I've seen that you know, in Pakistan, right? I mean, Sajad would say that it, you know, two million, three million people coming to a city like Karachi with the infrastructure is actually totally crowded. Uh, it creates a problem of availability, uh, you know, inflation, mm -hmm. uh, black marketing, etc. So, you know, if, if the camp is close to, or if the displaced people are close to urban areas, you know, those are some of the, the, the issues that one has to face. How does one take care of that? I think if one of the assumptions fail, we should not go for this kind of solution. The other side is also, these are short-term solutions, so right when the, after the displacement, and it's not meant to long-term uh, development solution. We're really trying to kind of save lives in the short term. That's the main goal. Thank you. Fuck. 
Yes, two questions. Um, do you think your um, idea would work for natural disasters like in the United States? And two, do you foresee an app that would allow us, instead of contributing to an organization which eventually gets the money to that person three years from now, that we could just send money directly to a person um, from our cell phone and have it get there immediately? So right after the, the tsunami that some of you are familiar with, you saw people, um, pictures of areas completely destroyed. That, luckily enough, was just on the coast, and right after, like hospitals, et cetera, were still working. And some organizations said, thank you for sending us all this huge donation, but we also managed to understand that things are still working in this area. I think that's a great example to see how a natural disaster cash can still be a, a very effective solution. In terms of apps, I think that's a good question, too. Um, a lot of organizations right now are scaling up that kind of projects and also testing it in uh, more development settings. And I'm not that I know there are apps still available, but I think you still need that kind of coordination and assessment of actually who's receiving at the level of poverty. Um, I think it's something that should be developed, though. Can, can I ask you a quick question? When, when disaster hits, like most recently, in Puerto Rico, here on campus, and um, I'm sure this happened at Duke as well, students do a fabulous job of wanting to help. And they have drives. And they gather stuff. Why do they gather stuff and not cash? I'm stealing in a, uh, I don't know why. I think that there's something, okay. First of all, they want to contribute and do something good. Right. Otherwise, they would do nothing. And I think that's, that's important. The second part, and I'm going to steal a quote uh, from the director of an international organization, is imagine that tomorrow there's a natural disaster here. You need to move to another state, and organizations come in from Europe, and they don't know how good tastes bacon here, eggs, and, and all the delicious food in North Carolina. What would you prefer? Would you prefer to receive a box and say, here it is, this is a box of items I think you're going to use? Or would you prefer to receive cash and you decide what you, got, what you actually need and use it that way? So that would be my answer. So, so think about the impact that you have on the, on the final people. And then think about whether I'm, whether I'm right, whether there's an emotional tug to give material versus cash, if cash just seems crass. But counterintuitively, cash oftentimes is the better thing to give. Yes, sir, in the red. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. And I just wanted to point out a couple of things that I take, that I take away from what you're talking about. As a social worker, um, one of the things I find, and I, I don't recall if you touched on it or not, but was the idea of restoring dignity. Yeah. Um, because I know having, having worked in international disasters with the Red Cross and so forth, that's one of the first things to go out the door, is the, the dignity and, and the, the ability of a, of a head of the family or a husband to be, because now they, their job of, of family protector and, and so forth is gone. And so even in these, and I've never, although I've wanted to, I have yet to be able to get over to Jordan or one of the countries where the Syrian refugees are, but I can just imagine that the internal, the psychological devastation and the, the ability of cash says, we're going to trust you to make that decision that you feel is best to help your family move forward. We're not going to say, well, here, you got to take this. And so I thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for summarizing the proposal so well. So I think it's, it's time to wrap up. It's time to wrap up. Uh, thank you so very much to Gabrielle, to the fabulous other presenters, and please enjoy a 20-minute break, I believe. It was great. Thank you. There, just an announcement. There is coffee upstairs. Wow. So oh, there's wow. coffee up. <laughs> I heard that you knocked it out of the park, Gabrielle. We will start again at exactly oh, I'm happy. 10, this place, five. This place. Yeah, it, it took a little bit of work and time. Thank you.